Welcome back to Harbour Unboxed. Okay, so a little while ago now, I reviewed the AMD Athlon 200 GE. Actually, it was about six weeks ago now, and I remember rushing to cover it because we had RTX 2070 samples incoming, and that content was due the following day. Anyway, I promised that I would revisit discrete GPU testing with the 200 GE, but of course that got delayed by about 20 different content pieces centered around numerous product and game releases. So once I wrapped up the Threadripper testing, I took a quick look at the calendar and realized that there were going to be very few opportunities to revisit the Athlon APU unless I acted fast. So I dug out the plucky little Zen base chip and for comparison, grab the Ryzen 3 2200G and Intel's Pentium G5400. Now, let me start by attempting to head off a few concerns about this test. Uh, I haven't included the Core i3 8100, and there are a few reasons for this. Firstly, at the current $130 US asking price, it doesn't really make that much sense. Uh, the Ryzen 3 2200G, which was already my preferred choice of these two processors, uh, well, that comes in at $100 US, so it is quite a bit cheaper. Uh, that being the case, I didn't want to waste another day testing a CPU that we previously haven't recommended at a lower price point. Today's video has been sponsored by ASRock and the new Phantom Gaming range of Z390 motherboards. The Z390 Phantom Gaming 6 and 9 include a blazing fast 2.5 gigabits per second network interface, offering gamers and content creators two and a half times the bandwidth compared to standard gigabit ethernet. For more information, please check the link in the video description. Intel's current budget lineup just isn't doing it for me, and this was the case even before the 14 nanometer shortage. In the past, I have preferred Intel budget offerings to those from AMD. I loved the Pentium G4560. I really couldn't talk enough about that thing. I think I made about a dozen videos within a month. A few years earlier, I was raving about the value of the Core i5-6600K compared to the FX garbage AMD was peddling at the time. The quad-core scale lake part was a bit of all right. But in 2018, things have changed. Boy, oh boy, have they changed, and for the better. $64 dual cores like the G4560 won't even get gamers out of bed anymore. Not when a processor like the 6-core 12-thread Ryzen 5 2600 can be had for just $160 US. And even if you don't have that kind of money, the quad-core Ryzen 3 2200G is also a bit special at $100, and certainly the go-to option for budget builders. In fact, thanks to its exceptional value, it often ranks in the top 5 bestseller list on Amazon. Then for even less, we have the Athlon 200GE. It's 40% cheaper at just $60, but I have to say it doesn't quite give us the fizz like the pure quad-core 2200G does. The 200GE is a dual core with SMT. It's locked and it comes with a piddly little cooler, but again, it also costs just $60, almost half that of Intel's cheapest Pentium branded Coffee Lake CPU, the Pentium G5400, which currently sells for $110. For a direct cost comparison, I would need to get my hands on a Celeron G4920, a 3.2 GHz dual core with just 2 MB of L3 cache, and that part will almost certainly get slayed by the Athlon 200GE. So what I want to know is, if you're on a super tight budget, should you buy the Athlon 200GE? It's really the only sub $100 US option right now, and frankly, while the Pentium G5400 uh, is included for comparison's sake, at the current asking price, which sees it cost more than the Ryzen 3 2200G, basically means, well, it's essentially a dead product at this point, I suppose. Still, we do have the 2200G or the 200GE, and if you're a gamer using a discrete graphics card, should you save every last dollar and go with the 200GE and then upgrade to something better in the future, uh, something like the Ryzen 5 2600, for example, or should you spend a little bit more now and land yourself the 2200G? It's only $40 more, but are you going to see that much of a performance increase? Well, let's go find out. The Athlon 200G has been tested with dual channel DDR4 2666CL16 memory, the Pentium G5400 with dual channel DDR4 2400CL16 memory, and the Ryzen 3 2200G with DDR4 3200CL16 memory. Just quickly, for those unaware, the reason for the different memory speeds comes down to what these CPUs officially support. The 200GE can only run with DDR4 memory up to 2666, while the Pentium processor is limited to 2400 memory 
memory on locked motherboards such as the H370, for example. The Ryzen 3 2200G doesn't have any kind of memory limitation, at least not one that's imposed by uh, the motherboard or anything else like that. It's pretty much whatever the memory controller itself can handle. Typically, they work just fine with 3200 memory, and we recommend using at least 3000 spec memory with this APU. The GPU used is the RTX 2080 Ti, and yes, I know, I know, it's an unrealistic GPU and yada yada yada. But I want to be able to directly compare the data with the higher end CPUs that I've already gathered, and frankly, it really makes no difference. The margins seen at 1080p with these CPUs will be much the same with the GTX 1070, especially when comparing these CPUs in modern titles, as we're almost CPU bound and to show that I will provide some evidence uh, and perhaps a bit of context. Of course, the entire point of testing and comparing these CPUs is to test CPU performance, not low end GPU performance. So if you understand this and are happy with that, then let's continue. If not, well, not really sure what you do with that. Anyway, onto the benchmarks. First up, we have Assassin's Creed Odyssey, and being the CPU demanding title that it is, we find some extremely CPU bound results with these entry level CPUs. Because of this, the 1080p, 1440p, and 4K results are all identical, so let's just discuss the 1080p numbers. The Pentium G5400 was clearly much faster than the Athlon 200G, as it allowed for 18% more performance. And at these sub 60 FPS frame rates, that's a very big and very noticeable difference. However, the 2200G was 20% faster again, allowing for an average of 48 FPS. And that's again, a very big, very noticeable performance improvement. The 2200G was also 41% faster than the 200G. So in my opinion, it's certainly well worth spending the extra $40 to get the real quad core CPU. Now, if we look at the kind of performance that a GTX 1070 is capable of, we see that at 1080p, you'd still very much be heavily CPU limited in this title with any one of the three CPUs tested here. And the same is true for 1440p as well. Though naturally of these CPUs, the 2200G gets the closest to finding the 1070's limits. It's not until we reach 4K, a resolution that the 1070 isn't designed for, that we finally see a GPU limited scenario. Getting back to 1080p and 1440p though, I do realize that the GTX 1070 is still a fairly powerful and reasonably expensive GPU. Most entry level CPU owners would be looking at more like say a GTX 1050 or RX 560 for example. However, remember we are using ultra type quality settings here. Granted in this title we are using Tim's optimized settings, but they are still very high overall in terms of visual quality. Those using a lower end GPU will likely want to reduce the quality settings in an effort to raise the frame rate and target something like 60 FPS, and therefore you are really hunting for the same kind of frame rate shown here with the GTX 1070. If all you want is a console like 30 FPS, then your choice of CPU doesn't really matter. Moving on, Assassin's Creed Origins provides us with some rather different margins. Here the 2200G offers slightly better performance than the dual core processors, 55% uh, more performance than the 200G and at least 40% more than the G5400, though the margin did extend up to 55% at the 4K resolution. The dual core SMT enabled 200GE and G5400 really struggle with this title and are only just able to deliver playable performance. Frame rates with the 2200G were worlds better to be honest, and frame rates were knocking on the door of 60 FPS. Here we see with the GTX 1070, even the 2200G would be leaving performance on the table at 1080p with the very high quality preset. You'd see much the same at 1440p, while 4K does become extremely GPU bound. Again, the 2200G is certainly looking like the best value option for those using a discrete GPU. Next up we have Battlefield 1 and here the 2200G was 51% faster than the 200G at 1080p and 24% faster than the Pentium G5400. Those margins were also seen at 1440p and then reduced quite heavily at 4K as we start to become GPU bound here with the 2200G. Throw in the GTX 1070 for reference and here we see at 1080p we'd still be heavily CPU bound while the GPU becomes the performance limiting factor at 1440p for the 2200G and at G5400. Then at 4K we're heavily GPU bound with the 1070 with all three CPUs. 
Forza Horizon 4 isn't a CPU intensive game, and as you can see, even the Athlon 200GE enables a great gaming experience. The Pentium G5400 was a little faster, and then the 2200G a little faster again, but overall, a similar experience with all three CPUs. Throw in the GTX 1070, and we're still GPU bound at all three resolutions, so this is a good example of a gaming title that is mostly GPU bound. I think it's fair to say most games probably are GPU limited rather than CPU limited, so this is a good representation of how these CPUs will perform in most titles. Of course, for this video, we are primarily focusing on CPU intensive titles. This is where uh, you'll run into the most trouble with a lower end CPU. The often NPC heavy Hitman is a CPU intensive title and here we see the Athlon 200G really struggling and basically failing this test as it often dipped below 30 FPS. The Pentium G5400 was better, but even then we did see regular dips below 30 FPS. In order to keep frame rates above 30 FPS, you will require the 2200G. So for this title, the quad core CPU is not really optional, it's more mandatory. It's a must have item over the 200GE and G5400. Then throw in the GTX 1070, and again we're still heavily CPU bound at 1080p, even with the Ryzen 3 2200G. The quad core APU though is right on the edge at 1440p, and then at 4K we are mostly GPU bound. Moving on we have Project Cars 2, and here the Pentium G5400 really struggles with its frame time performance. Average frame rate performance is comparable to the 200G, with both falling just shy of 60fps. Of course, the game was playable, but as we've found many times already, the 2200G offers a significant performance boost. At 1080p, the Ryzen 3 APU was at least 57% faster, then 39% faster at 1440p, and then finally 29% faster at 4K. When looking at the GTX 1070 results, we see that the 2200G can maximize this GPU at 1080p and 1440p, whereas the other two CPUs can't. Then of course, once again, we are GPU bound with all three processors at the 4K resolution. Rainbow Six Siege ideally requires a true quad-core processor, though having said that the Athlon 200GE does enable highly playable performance in our test. Still at 1080p, the 2200G was 41% faster, while the G5400 was 17% faster. The margin does close up a little at 1440p, and then we see it completely neutralized at 4K. Had I primarily tested with a GTX 1070, then the margins would certainly be much smaller, as all three CPUs can max out this GPU at 1080p, and therefore 1440p and 4K. Second last game tested is Star Wars Battlefront 2, and here we see some pretty weak performance from the Athlon 200GE. At 1080p, the G5400 was 33% faster, and the 2200G 67% faster. That said, frame time performance of the dual core G5400 and 2200G was comparable. The 2200G was at least 51% faster here. Then at 1440p and 4K, the 2200G maintains a strong advantage in frame time performance over the dual core processors. Throwing in the GTX 1070 shows that none of these CPUs can max it out at 1080p, while the 2200G and G5400 can at 1440p, though the G5400's frame time performance will still be weak as we're looking at the average frame rate here. Then at 4K, all three CPUs can max out the GTX 1070, but we're talking about an average of 35fps. Finally, we have Shadow of the Tomb Raider, and here the dual core 200G and G5400 tanked in a big way. Neither were able to deliver playable performance in our test. This is certainly not a dual core friendly title, and we will no doubt see many more of these moving forward. The game ran reasonably well on the 2200G, but was basically broken on the dual cores. With the GTX 1070, even the 2200G is leaving loads of performance on the table at 1080p and 1440p, and by the time we hit 4K, we're pretty much GPU bound, with an average of just 33 FPS. Chances are with the GTX 1070, you'd opt for medium quality settings to try and lift up the frame rate. Okay, so we can conclude a few things based on the testing seen in this video, and I will start with the Athlon 200GE and Pentium G54 comparison. Of course, we're going to have to pretend that the G5400 is selling at, or at least near, the $64 US MSRP, rather than the current $110 US asking price. And that would mean the 200GE and G5400 cost roughly the same amount of money. So that being the case, which one of the two should you buy? Those of you planning on using a discrete GPU will, for the most part, be best served by the Pentium G5400, as it was on average 16% faster at 1080p. We did see a few scenarios where the Intel CPU was up to 30% faster, 
Uh, that said, for the most part, we did see comparable frame time performance. So probably bring that closer down to the 16% we saw on average. Anyway, if you plan on using a discrete GPU, the G5400 will provide the best experience of these two CPUs. That said, there are still a few reasons why you might pick the Athlon 200G over the G5400, assuming they were selling for the same price. Uh, right now, you'd obviously go with the AMD processor in today's market as it's almost half the price. But yeah, in my hypothetical scenario here where they are similar prices, there still could be some reasons why you might buy the 200GE. For example, it packs significantly better integrated graphics, though admittedly, you won't use that if you are using a discrete graphics card. That said, you might be lured by the superior platform, at least in my opinion, uh, the AM4 platform is superior, especially at the entry level, because you can buy a B350 or B450 motherboard uh, that'll support a Ryzen 7 2700X processor, for example, and those cost about $60 US. Meanwhile, I'd suggest you're looking at about $70 US for a decent quality B360 motherboard or $100 for a basic Z370 board. And again, I suspect that both of those boards probably will throttle with a high-end uh, six or eight core Intel processor. I also suspect that we're at the end of the road for 300 series chipsets. Uh, there'll be no new CPUs, uh, at least no new CPUs well into the future with node shrinks and more performance and all that kind of good stuff, you will probably just see refreshes at this point. So not terribly exciting for the Intel 300 series boards. Uh, on the other side of that though, we have the AMD 300 series and 400 series chipsets, such as your B350 boards and your B450 boards, pretty much any AM4 board, and they will support the upcoming seven nanometer Zen 2 CPU. So, yeah, that's kind of nice. This means while the G5400 is hands down the better gaming CPU with a discrete GPU, even at $64 US, it's not really the obvious choice while the current $110 US price, as I've said, makes it a complete nutter write-off. At the end of the day though, for anyone with a big enough budget to include, well, any kind of discrete graphics card, I wouldn't even bother with the Athlon 200GE. It's a locked part, which in my opinion makes it virtually worthless for those trying to maximize value. Admittedly, it is a great sort of general computing type product. It's excellent for web browsing, getting emails and all that kind of stuff. So probably, you know, a really great CPU for building a budget system for office use or your parents or your grandparents or whatever. I imagine that most of you, or almost everyone watching this video, would be worlds better off spending the $40 more to land the Ryzen 3 2200G. Just a much more capable CPU uh, and therefore, in my opinion, there's no real reason to uh, even consider the 200GE. Also, something that I didn't touch on in this video, but we have covered numerous times in the past on the channel, is the overclocking potential of the 2200G. So there is some more free performance to be had. So this really means it is the best value entry-level CPU available right now, and spending less than $100 US on something else doesn't really end up saving you any money at all, at least in my opinion. And with that, I'm going to end this one. If you enjoy the video, well, please hit the like button for us. That's much appreciated. Subscribe for more content just like this. And if you appreciate the work we do at Harbour Box, then consider supporting us on Patreon. Thank you for watching. I'm your host, Steve. See you again next time.